And so after what seems like a very, very long introduction, we finally get to the beginnings of chemistry. That is, how did chemistry begin? What, what got this whole thing about chemistry started? I assume, probably, it all really got started when people were mixing stuff together and they saw what happened. Uh, but in the 1700s, the late 1700s and early 1800s, really things began to come together. And reviewing how things came together, I think, helps you understand a little bit better about what chemistry is about. So one of the things that kind of clicked with certain scientists, Lavoisier and others, um, in the late 1700s was that they found that in, when things were reacting with each other, the total mass stayed the same. So if you're, if you're careful, now you have to be careful because you know, stuff gets, you know, in reaction, some stuff bubbles off as gas and so forth. So you have to be careful that you contain everything that's part of the reaction. But what scientists were discovering in the late 1700s is that when they mixed stuff together and when chemical reactions took place or even when they heated things up, that when they were careful to contain all of the stuff, that no matter was lost. That is the mass. The mass before the reaction and the mass after the reaction stayed the same in ordinary physical changes and reactions. Now the reason why I put ordinary physical changes and reactions is because some funky stuff happens when you're talking about stuff as big as the sun or when you're talking about um, relativity. You know, then some funky stuff, ha stuff happens. But in, in any kind of ordinary chemical reaction on Earth, um, the mass you have before the reaction is going to be the same as the total mass you have after the reaction if you're careful to account for everything. So this was kind of the first, the first data point that really built to uh, the birth of chemistry. Now, um, we call this the law of conservation of mass. Uh, conservation basically means you don't lose any. It, it cons it's conserved. You get to keep it all. Mass, um, this isn't a physics um, video, mass is a little bit different from weight, uh, although probably uh, for now you can kind of think of it uh, as weight, but mass is how much stuff uh, there is there. I think I talked about that in a previous video. Um, okay, moving along. The second thing that scientists were noticing in the late 1700s is that if they mixed stuff together, or the, if they broke things down, maybe it's better to say if they broke things down. So let's say that you had salt, and you, you, you had pure salt, and you broke down the salt into its compo components. Uh, for example, normal salt is sodium chloride. So um, sodium and chloride, if you could chlorine, if you could break it apart, uh, what they found is that when you, when you mix things together, and when you broke things apart, that they always mixed in fixed proportions as far as the mass is concerned. So for example, um, let me just use salt as an example. Um, if you have two pure samples of salt, you'll find in both samples that the proportion of sodium to chlorine by mass uh, is going to be the same. So for example, in the case of sodium chloride, it always breaks down into 39.34% sodium and 60.66% chlorine. So um, this is called the, the law of definite proportions. That when you break things down into their simplest parts, as best you know, um, they combine in definite ratios um, by mass. So that was the second. The first one was that no mass is created or destroyed in reactions. The mass stays the same. And the second is, is that these masses combine in fixed uh, ratios. Um, so the proportions of sodium mix with the same proportion of chlorine. Or in water, the same proportion of hydrogen um, is going to be, if you take water and you break it down into hydrogen and oxygen, you're going to have a, a definite proportion of hydrogen to oxygen every time. Um, it's, it's a fixed proportion. So that's the second blip. The third data point is a little harder to understand, but basically, it, let's say that you're combining nitrogen and oxygen. Um, what scientists found in the you know late 1700s 
is that you could combine things like nitrogen and oxygen and form slightly different compounds. But in those different compounds, the ratio of, say, oxygen in one compound um, and to the, to the ratio of oxygen in another compound, that there was, it was always a, a, a fixed multiple like one, two, three, or four. Let me see if I can get at this. There is twice as much oxygen in nitrogen dioxide as there is in no nit nitrogen monoxide. Now, of course, they didn't know chemical formulas in the late 1700s. They were, they were trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, so I'm giving you, the, you know, what we now know. Um, and you can see that there is twice as much oxygen in nitrogen dioxide as there is in nitrogen monoxide. There's only one oxygen in nitrogen monoxide, and there are two oxygens in nitrogen dioxide. These are chemical formulas that I'm showing you here. I haven't really gotten there yet, but hopefully you understand. The O2 means that there are two oxygens, and the O stands for oxygen, and the N stands for nitrogen. But they didn't know formulas back in the late 1700s. What they knew is that there was this one type of nitrogen-oxygen combination, and then there was this other kind of nitrogen-oxygen combination, and the, the ratio of oxygen in the one to the ratio of the oxygen in the other was there was twice as much as in, as in the other. So what they, what they concluded was is that these basic building blocks, we'll call them elements, these elements combine in ratios of simple whole numbers. Um, so it's either going to be one oxygen or two oxygens or three oxygens. You know, if there were a nitrogen trioxide, I don't think there is. But um, so this is called the law of multiple proportions. It's kind of a confusing title, I think. But all of it, all of it is saying is, is that that if you look at the the amount of oxygen in various compounds, um, it's in, going to be in multiples. Um, simple one time, two times, three times, and so forth. Okay, it was a guy named John Dalton in 1808 who put all this together. And uh, he wasn't entirely right on everything. Uh, he had five laws that he proposed, three of which we would still say are true, and two of which are not exactly right. But let me, let me reorder them and put them in an order uh, of, of what I'm saying here. So this isn't the order he put them in, uh, but I'm trying to present it in a way that will make sense. So first of all, he, he suggested that all matter is made up of extremely small particles called atoms. Now, he took the name atom from the Greeks because, you know, you know uh, 1,700, uh, well, actually more like 2,000 years earlier, a guy named Democritus had suggested that everything boiled down to atoms, uncuttable little things. Now, Dalton thought that, that atoms couldn't be destroyed or created. Um, we now know that that's not true. Um, an atom was, several atoms were destroyed in 1945 when we dropped an atom bomb, when the U.S. dropped an atom bomb on Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, wh what caused that atomic explosion? The breaking apart of atoms. So atoms can be actually destroyed. They can actually be created, too, um, in a way. Um, it's not very easy, but with a particle accelerator, you can do some, some stuff. Um, but, so, Dalton wasn't right on everything. But he, w he was right that all matter is made up of a limited number of extremely small Legos um, that, that, are, that we call atoms. Um, secondly, he was right that in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, they are separated, they are rearranged, but atoms are not um, created or destroyed in chemical reactions. Nuclear reactions, that's something different, uh, like in the bomb case. But in chemical reactions, the kinds of stuff you would do in a lab, uh, atoms are combined, separated, rearranged, but they're not created or destroyed. So the third thing I want to mention, again, I've reordered his, his, his list. Uh, atoms of different elements, they combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And that's what we were talking about, the law of multiple proportions. And finally, atoms of different elements differ in their physical and chemical properties. Now he had, his fifth one was that atoms that are the same have the same physical and chemical properties. But that's not true, um, because uh, you can have different versions of the same atom, uh, like carbon, uh, for example. But um, that's not important right now. Um, that one we can throw away. 
but he is he was correct that atoms of different elements differ in physical and chemical properties. Well, this is how chemistry began, how it started to really take on shape with the atomic uh, theory of John Dalton in the early 1800s. And from here, uh, the next video in this series will look at um, what the basic structure of an atom actually is.